Sherbourne is without doubt one of the most beautiful towns in England. The charming, honey-colored town is brimming with history and heritage and you're sure to be impressed by the array of beautiful buildings, including a magnificent abbey, that makes Sherbourne so special. This picture-perfect town boasts two castles, one romantic ruin and a delightful new castle with grounds designed by Lancelot Capability Brown which is featured a little later in this presentation. When people look at the abbey, they see different things. Some see the finest building in Dorset, with its glorious fan vaulting, of which Simon Jenkins is in his book, England's Thousand Best Churches, I would pit Sherborne's roof against any contemporary work of the Italian Renaissance. Others see a place renowned for its choir, its music and its bells, the heaviest peal of eight bells in the world. Some see 13 centuries of history, ever since St. Aldhelm, new bishop of the West Saxons, chose to build his cathedral here. Two Saxon kings are buried here, for over 800 years the chanting of Benedictine monks filled the air. Thomas Wyatt, Tudor courtier and poet, has his grave here, Sir Walter Raleigh worshipped here. The abbey is the spiritual home of a large and vibrant Christian community and, above all, a place of prayer and worship. The new cathedral of Sherborne served St. Aldhelm and 26 succeeding Saxon bishops. Small at first, it was later enlarged. A few important early features still survive, when you come into the abbey, see the fine Saxon doorway in the NW corner. Soon after the Norman conquest the bishop's seat was moved to Old Sarum, and later Salisbury. Earlier, in 998, St. Wolfson had ejected the community of secular canons who served the cathedral, and invited monks of the Order of St. Benedict to replace them. Sherborne Abbey remained a Benedictine house until 1539 when Abbot John Barnstable and his 16 fellow monks surrendered it to King Henry VIII. Relations between the monks and the people of Sherborne were not always good, such that the Church of All Hallows was built by the monks, actually joined to the abbey itself. On the outside, to the left and right of the west end the joins can still be seen. This smaller church was for the use of the townspeople, who always resented being pushed out of what had once been their church. Tensions between the monks and the town came to a head in 1437 when the people decided they had had enough of having to go cap in hand to the abbot every time they wanted to use the font for a baptism, and decided to erect a font of their own in All Hallows. The abbot was enraged, and according to the contemporary chronicles sent a stout butcher armed with a hammer into the smaller church to break the font. This caused a riot, during which a burning arrow was shot into the east end of the abbey, at that time full of wooden scaffolding for the rebuilding of the roof. The fire that resulted permanently reddened the walls of the choir and the crossing. It took the Pope himself to settle the conflict, and the people had to pay for the repairs. No wonder that at the Reformation they were delighted to regain possession of what has ever since been their parish church. They immediately pulled down all hallows as being surplus to requirements. Ironically, as you now enter the abbey by the southwest porch, you will see not only a large Victorian font just inside the door, but if you look straight down the south aisle you will see in the distance another font, in the bow chapel. The bowl of this is clearly medieval, and just possibly all that remains of the broken font from All Hallows. The abbey also contains some notable monuments. There is a fine monument to John Digby, third and last Earl of Bristol, and his two wives. He played an important part in throwing Dorset behind William of Orange at the time of the Glorious Revolution in 1688 which led to the flight of King James II and the accession of William and Mary. The St. Catherine's Chapel contains the fine Lewiston Monument and also most of the abbey's surviving medieval glass. There is a monument to Sir John Horsey, the man who bought the abbey estates from the Crown at the time of the Reformation. The massive release of monastic lands led to many a rich merchant acquiring a great country estate at a knockdown price and contributed to the rise of a gentry class in England. In addition to the above there are regimental standards and emblems and memorials to the Dorsetshire Regiment, the Devon and Dorset Regiment and also the Rifles. There are tombs to former abbots, a window by Augustus Pugin and a fine organ by Gray and Davidson. But above all it is a place of prayer, worship and quiet where one can come, whatever your faith or belief, small or great, to be still, reflect, 
wonder, admire, look for answers, give thanks, or to just offer up your own personal prayers. We are open 365 days of the year. Do come and tread where thousands have trod before. After passing through Sherborne on the way to Plymouth, Sir Walter Raleigh fell in love with the castle, and Queen Elizabeth relinquished the estate, leasing it to Raleigh in 1592. Rather than refurbish the castle, Raleigh decided to build a new house for temporary visits. He completed Sherborne Lodge, a four-story rectangular building, in 1594. The antiquary John Aubrey described the building as a delicate lodge in the park, of brick, not big, but very convenient for its bignies, a place to retire from the court in summertime, and to contemplate, etc. It had four polygonal corner turrets with angled masonry as if they were to serve for military defense, which Nicholas Cooper suggests may be an obeisance to the old building. Its most progressive feature for its date was the entrance, disguised in one of the corner towers so as not to spoil the apparent symmetry of the façade, which was centered on a rectangular forecourt. The entrance vestibule also contained a winder stairwell and gave directly onto the hall. During Raleigh's imprisonment in the tower, King James leased the estate to Robert Carr and then sold it to Sir John Digby, 1st Earl of Bristol in 1617. In the 1620s, the Digby family added four wings to Sherborne Lodge in an architectural style similar to the original, forming the mansion now known as Sherborne Castle or Sherborne New Castle. Lord Digby was a royalist advisor to the king during the Civil War, and Sherborne was a strongly royalist area. The fortified old castle was captured by parliamentarians in September 1642, and recaptured in February 1643. In early August 1645, a new model army force under Sir Thomas Fairfax laid siege to the castle, then occupied by a royalist garrison commanded by Sir Louis Dive. Following heavy bombardment and mining, Dive surrendered on 17 August 1645. The old castle was slighted in October 1645 and left in ruins.